welcome to the Scouse Science Podcast. My name is Tom Solomon. I'm Professor of Neurology here at the University of Liverpool, where I'm also the Director of the UK's Emerging Infections Research Units. My guests today are the DJ and electronic music artist Youssef and Dr. Eduardo Coutinho of the University of Liverpool Department of Music and Holly Ellis. Say hello, guys. Hi. Hello. Hello. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. Now, the observant among our audience who are always very sharp will have noticed that Holly Ellis, it doesn't say Holly Ellis next to her name anymore. It says Holly O'Day. Have I said that right? Just O'Day. See, this is the pro- this is the problem. <laughs> O'Day. 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 That's O'Day. It. I'm going to have to get it tattooed on my head, I think. I think, I think you will. <laughs> not O'Day, as I said earlier. O'Day. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Now, our, our regular audience will know you got married some months ago, but you've finally, you know, taken the plunge. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So this has been the problem all along because the spelling of the name is so difficult. Ellis was straightforward, um, but I finally given in and, and become an O'Day officially. But this is just the start of, of the stress of the name change now. The, uh, it's the start of the stress of married life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. A little bit of housekeeping before we introduce our guests properly. So we have the Zoom chat function. Please uh, send in your comments. Let us know where you're listening from, whether you are a first timer or whether you are a repeat offender. George Cunningham has already said, hi, guys. Great to see you again. Hi, George. And uh, there you are. You see, you've got a friend there, George. (laughs) And you, sir. uh, And um, Facebook as well. We get a lot of our viewers on Facebook. We're live stream to Facebook. So type your comments in there and let us know uh, where you're listening from. A lot of the international listeners come from uh, our Facebook. So we have people in Asia and the Americas and uh, Africa as well. And then to check it's working, we always like to ask a question. And um, well, I was I think I don't know whether today's poll should be whether Holly should stick with Holly Ellis or she, she should become <laughs> Holly O'Dea. But I think it's a bit late. For that, it's it, too Holly? late. Yeah, it's too late. For it's that, O'Day. No. O'Day. Oh, O'Day. O'Day. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, today's question, actually, we're going to be today's podcast is all about music and dance and and how it makes us feel. And we're going to be hearing a bit more about uh, Yusuf shortly. But I think for the question uh, for the audience to get you warmed up is when did you last dance or really let your hair down or go for it? Um, I might, I'm even going to try and play you a little bit of video uh, later on so that you can see what this is all about. So do let us know via the chat function when you last really let your hair down and, and, and what, what you did. And maybe I should put that to our, our fine guest today. Holly, Holly, first of all, when did you last let your hair down and what was it? Um, probably on Saturday because I was on a hen do, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> so um, it's, um, yeah, I, I'm quite... Um, often letting, letting me hair down at the weekends. I think if you've got a stressful job, then you just need to have a dance and relax. I agree totally. You said <laughs> what about you? Um, well, I guess, I, I, well, in inverted commas, work on Saturday when I did two gigs in Bristol. It was a, a daytime and a nighttime, almost like two sittings of this event. Um, and pretty chilled guy, easy going, but when, but when, I, when I play, I really kind of go for it. So, yeah, on Saturday, I was stomping in the booth. You were brilliant. Eduardo, what about you? Well, going out, I probably cannot remember. It's probably pre-COVID. But we danced quite a lot at home um, with the uh, kid and my wife. We like that a lot. So we play music. Sometimes you have friends around. It always ends up in dancing. I think it's, you know, is the, the, the sign that the party's going well. Yeah, partying in the kitchen. <laughs> There's a few people I can see in the chat partying in the kitchen. Claire McGiven has a kitchen rave every Sunday when cooking the roast. <laughs> That's We do a bit of that, but dancing around our kitchen with the dog, with Peggy. So um, <laughs> I, I can't remember. Oh, and I was at a wedding recently, actually. It's the um, uh, tobacco, uh, not the tobacco warehouse, the the Titanic Hotel, which used to be the um, rum warehouse, wasn't it? I think. And that's a, that was a great place. We had a really good dance there. So um, anyway, let's, let me introduce our guests properly. So... Um, First of all, uh, Eduardo Coutinho, who is a uh, in the Department of Music, and he's a music psychologist here at the University of Liverpool. 
and um, senior lecturer here at the moment. Previously, he's worked at University of Augsburg in, is that Germany, Augsburg? Sounds uh, yeah. Austria. Yeah. Uh, and Imperial College, also the Swiss Centre for Effective Sciences. And you're now the director of the Applied Music Research Lab here in Liverpool. Uh, and the purpose of the lab is to bring the benefits of music from improving people's lives. Is that right? Just tell us a little bit more about that. Yes. So I've been working mostly in topics related to music and emotion for many years. But at some point, I thought that actually from observing the many ways in actually music transforms people's lives, I thought we need to know more about this and uh, not only know about it, um, but also use it systematically, bring these things more to people. So that's the spirit with which we started the lab, make yeah. it to people's lives better, empower them to do it. Great. And we'll be hearing a, a bit more about that shortly and music transforming people's lives. So let's introduce Yusuf properly, regarded as one of the world's foremost electronic music artists. And I use the word DJ uh, to begin with, because I think that word will be more familiar to some of our audience. But uh, DJ doesn't really uh, sell it, I don't think. DJ is about somebody just putting the old record on. And this is really it's a, it's, it's a different art form, I think, isn't it? Um, Joseph's known for his effervescent personality, his supreme deck skills. Decks are the music mixing decks, I think. And um, but also, so it's about going to clubs and festivals and doing sets there. And you've done, I know you've done some amazing things all around the world. I think in Mexico you did an event with twenty five thousand people. Um, but our first, our paths first crossed because you were involved in the first dance, as it's been called. In Liverpool, which was a COVID event, just tell us a bit about that, Yusuf. Hi, hi. Um, yeah, I guess it was interesting what Eduardo was saying about the psychology of music because it's very important to with with DJ as well. It's very much connected to be able to kind of feel out what people may or may not want while trying to kind of entertain and enlighten them sound like simultaneously. Um, but in in Liverpool, of course, everything was shut down for for COVID reasons, which was obviously very well documented and then in in the background uh, you could self was involved in the mass testing which kind of brought the possibilities of being able to get liverpool back on its feet um obviously the very first in the country but, but, but because of that lineage simultaneously i was knocking down the doors on local governments local mps and then even uh, central government myself and business partner richard and our small team to be able to kind of see if we can get back to try to be able to reopen in some some capacity now when liverpool or the government decided the the r rate was at a certain level and because of the mass test in liverpool was was chosen because you, you had the kind of momentum that was one part of it and then simultaneously we, we we were knocking down the doors and we had the facilities we had the venue we had the experience you had the production team we had the health and safety everything was just aligned so Liverpool Council came to us and said, OK, would you like to do the first um, government restart programme, the ERP? He said, OK, when is it? Oh, you have got you've got three weeks, <laughs> like <laughs> three weeks. No, you, you wouldn't dream of doing a gig under normal circumstances in three weeks because you wouldn't be able to sell the tickets for a start or, or get the infrastructure organised. But because obviously we'd been shut for close to 14, 15 months at that point or something, 16 months, um, we said, okay, let's go for it. It was it was very risky, both reputationally, um, educationally, because we had to kind of learn on the job. And as you as you'll know, every day there was a new set of rules, um, and then obviously uh, economically as well, because I don't think people realised that themselves and our small team at Circus had to had to kind of take all the risk economically, which was very scary after not earning any money for eighteen months. Mm. But because of the incredible amount of people involved in the event, of course, Liverpool universities um, and the health and safety of Liverpool Council, the full squad, all of us individually contributed to this kind of one moment um, and including the, the people who bought tickets or, or the ravers, they're, they're just as important in, uh, as in everything that we did. But on the day, just about by the skin of our teeth managed to get it over the line um, for all sorts of reasons maybe we'll go into later mm. but it was just absolutely incredible and this it was, was significant so this was the first um sort of big public event dance event to show that you could 
have these kind of events and that if you tested yeah. people beforehand and made sure, and then people were also tested again afterwards you could show that you could do this kind of event in a in a safe way and this i think came on so liverpool we'd already done the mass testing programs again where sort of first for the whole country just to show how you how you do these things and, and of course now we we accept mass testing all the time everybody's mm-hmm. testing themselves twice a week but we forget that back then um, the only testing was available through booking, et cetera. And it was trying to see, would it work? Could these things help? Um, and it did help. I mean, how many people did you have at the, the those events? They were not little parties in like no, no. I was at at the, t- at the hotel. Well, exactly. We, we, yeah. we had six and a half thousand of, of, over two days. And it was really interesting, the, speaking about the, the testing, because mm. we thought there would be more resistance to it in, in a lot of ways. And don't get me wrong, but there was... Uh, a bit of pushback online shall we say but um in terms of kind of the overall support for for the idea it it was almost like a blanket coverage even Mm. from obviously our audience for the most part 18 to 30s um which you know they were among the kind of age range that apparently were not going to get sick and all those things and that was well documented too they were first in the queue. They were very happy to kind of um, be part of, of the, the experience and the experiment. And they, they, they tr- trusted it in the science, just like we all did. And they were very, very kind of in, like, vital, vitally important to be able to kind of make the mm. whole uh, function work. We talk about um, music making people feel good. Um, do you think, was it even more enhanced at this event than, than, than a normal party that you would run? By, by a hundredfold. <clears throat> now, people were obviously they've been locked, literally locked indoors for, for mm. many, many months for all those reasons, unable to kind of socialize. Um, once you were, you were over the threshold, just to paint the picture, um, there was no masks, no social distancing. It was the first place in kind of the Western Hemisphere to, to, to do this. In fact, it was probably the first place of that scale anywhere in the world, really, mm. um, at, at that moment. And so, it was really significant. And of course, it was on every major news channel across the world. It was the biggest news story around the world for, for two days. So for the people to come in, not only were they excited to have that release of energy, see the friends, listen to music, listen to a world-class lineup uh, in a club that they frequent regularly, which they trust, um, and all those things. Plus, it was a big kind of part of like a cultural moment for, mm. for lots and lots of reasons. When those people walked across the dance floor, when I say walked, when they came through the threshold, they literally ran as fast as they could to, to the front of the decks. Now, I wanted to play the very first record, uh, which, which it did, and I made this record called Welcome to the World, um, and I just put it on. <clears throat> and people were coming in, like literally, and well, I'm not even exaggerating here, on the knees, screaming and shouting <laughs> just because the, they, they were indoors. And one, one girl um, gave me this thank you card, which you keep on the studio, you know, just as a just as a reminder of how, how much it meant to so many people. Mm. Why? Uh, why? Let, let's just take a step back. I mean, in general, Eduardo, why? You know, you, we, we're talking about the psychology, the effects of music on people. What? What? What do we know about why music does make people feel good? Uh, well, various things. I mean, on, on, on as a principle, music or the brain already considers music to be rewarding and pleasurable, no? So it starts, you know, producing all the kinds of hormones that make us feel good. Um, and of course, we experience the pleasure result of that. We can relax or experience a whole range of uh, positive feelings and eventually go back for more, right? Um, but there are also other things why uh, the, the way that people use music in everyday life, in my opinion, is also extremely important for the reasons why people make us feel good. And in events like this, the, um, the social component uh, intensifies these experiences to a level that, uh, you know, goes beyond the type of experience that we can have listening at home in the modern way, not sitting at home with our headphones. There's, and and um, uh, you talked about the social component. So there's the element of music itself. And then there's the element of um, the fact that you're interacting with other people who are, who are engaged in the same thing. Definitely. I mean, if we think about music and even before the old recording industry, music was, you know, lived life. No, the experiences of music were life, essentially. No? That's what we're talking about here. And one of the powerful things of those experiences are also what is being shared between the different people. No, So music brings people together 
uh, it synchronizes them at many levels, including emotionally, we can create very powerful experiences, but we also influence each other. So, no, Yusef is definitely also the way that he communicates with the public will be influencing the experiences of the public and vice versa. I would imagine that was something I had in mind to ask actually, but also between them, the way that people move, the, the, the emotions that they're expressing are uh, creating some sort of emotional contagion in, and, um, and creating these very powerful experiences uh, that can only happen in those settings. Well, they can also happen in our minds somehow, but very powerful uh, because they are not also controlled. No, they are very natural. Did you say emotional contagion then? Yes. Yeah. No, the way, the, the way that our emotions spread uh, from one person to the other in an automatic way, which is so important for the ways that we communicate emotionally in life, is the way that we regulate all kinds of relationships. And music makes us do that as well, but, you know, in a safe environment and a lot of positive emotions going on. So, you know, that's why it's so positive. And I would imagine also why people were so eager just to go there and release themselves and be able to have that collective experience. Mm, yeah. And I think it was one of the things that people missed, uh, Yusuf, right throughout all the, you know, the lockdowns was the ability to interact either in small ways or in those big kind of mass event sort of ways. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it wasn't just um, just the crowd that felt that. It was the, the security team, the health and safety team, our events production team, our staff, myself, everyone. Just being able to see people when you, we hadn't seen people for, for so long and just feel temporarily normal. And it was a bit weird, I have to admit, you know, with no masks and social distancing. And some people chose to kind of still keep those uh, choices in place. Uh, but not many i'm like literally a sprinkling of like six thousand maybe maybe one or two or three but um yeah it was it was really it was really interesting and like like you say it, it feels in a lot of ways like a lifetime ago but it was less than a year that it, and the world was so different um and i think we've come a long way yeah it's funny isn't it how much things have changed i mean at your events now are people still uh just still get some people wearing masks because you know, the numbers are going up again, unfortunately, with this virus, or, or are people just completely back to normal, would you say? Well, what, what we did, because of the, the position that we put ourselves in, uh, we, we found a, um, you know, a responsibility to, to be first. Now, when the government had come in not long ago and said, look, we have to have testing on the doors to go into mass events, we started that with immediate effect after the first dance. So with ourselves um, and our partners like Fabric in London, uh, Printworks, Shindig in Newcastle, um, Warehouse Project in Manchester, and our whole um, kind of network of friends, we all opted together to ask our audience to have testing on the doors four, five, six months ahead before the government brought it in. And like I said earlier on, with the um, 18 to 30 year olds who we thought expected some resistance from, there's absolutely none. And I think what we found very quickly and even kind of like logically it tells you that once you've had your test, you're actually in the safest possible environment. Uh, and uh, we were way ahead, like I say, of government regulation. So the children, sorry, the kids were coming in and having a great time and um, they felt safe and there was almost kind of no, um, no problem with it at all. Yeah. No masks, though, I have to, have to admit. You know, once, once we were inside, the kids were, were just going for it. Yeah, yeah. Let's, um, uh, Eduardo. We'll get we'll get Holly in in a minute just to tell us uh, about the chat and questions in the uh, stratosphere out there. But Eduardo, just in terms of now, I, you know, I'm interested in p whether, for example, your students and people you're teaching and how things are for you at the uni. Uh, you know, we can see you're working from home today. But whether people are, you think, getting back to normal? I think and the university still asks us to wear our, our masks when we wander around the campus, and um, uh, but how are, th how are things at your end of the campus, Eduardo? Uh, so, well, actually, this semester I'm on research leave, so it makes things different. I'm not in contact, direct contact with most students. Uh, but I work in the office every day. I'm going to the office. Do they know my bike broke? Just that, not for another reason. <laughs> um, but uh, I've been finding I'm not worried. I think generally people are less worried about that. As you said, said there are certain environments that people take care about testing themselves regularly. We do that at the university. You know, some kind of these are small, safe bubbles, which makes us also feel more uh, more relaxed. And 
to be honest, when I was teaching last semester, it felt so good, you know, to go back to the classroom and everybody, it was a little bit like the, um, the parties you were describing. I mean, people were coming back and being together and people were excited. So even the learning experience and that shared experience was amazing. I love more teaching last semester than I did before. And I have the impression uh, that the students also, and we tried also to make sure that there was a lot of social interaction um, not just a typical lecture, doing a lot of activities together. And I think that worked out brilliantly. You could see that in the feedback. You could see that, you know, in them, in the classroom as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, we'll ask people to post any questions or comments on the chat. And meanwhile, Holly, do you want to join us and tell us what the discussion's been? Yeah, so um, lots of comments and um, coming in. Someone, Rachel, on Facebook, um, Facebook was at the first dance and she said, Joseph, it was incredible. And I can definitely <laughs> relate to that because as we were talking about my wedding earlier, my wedding was last year and that was like a few days after the restrictions lifted. And I think because of that, everyone just totally went for it on the dance floor <laughs> and it was it made it, I think, even better than it, it would have been in the first place. Oh, um, so we were talking about our international listeners who got someone listening from Toronto. Plenty of people telling us about about their raves that they enjoy. Carla enjoys a 90s rave in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> Catherine does dance class twice a week, which is really good exercise. Um, and then there's a few questions coming in. So, so John on Facebook is asking you, Seth, about how you got into this career. And um, did you, at first, was it difficult? Did you get a lot of rejection? Because obviously, I suppose you don't just become well-established overnight. And, and how, did, how did that all start? Um, well, it, it was just an ambition from when I was, like, literally in single figures when I was a kid. I used to be, like, a bit of a break dancer and into hip-hop and, a, like, kind of counterculture if, if anything that was not on the radio I loved it um so so I wanted to kind of be be the DJ from when I was when I was even in school so when I got an opportunity to get some decks which was just by fluke which has evolved to the scar on my nose but that, that's a different story for another day um yeah it's just I, I just followed that path and then I got some decks started practicing eight nine ten hours a day and then eventually um, I started making mixtapes and I'd send them off to anyone that would listen. And then I sent, I sent a couple to this magazine called Music Magazine, which was like a major magazine, like Mix Mag or something. It was now. And um, I won. I won this DJing competition. And it got me a DJ gig at Ministry of Sound, and w which went quite well. And then it got me another one at Pasha in Ibiza, which went unbelievably well and I, I just turned up and did my thing thinking that's why everybody plays and it turns out they don't <laughs> you know, and I was just like going for it everyone was going nuts and I managed to get myself uh, an, an agent and sort of a manager and then things slowly continued from there but in, in terms of like setbacks uh, as the the guy who asked the question they do not stop you know in fact if, if anything there's one thing that I'd recommend in when, in any field really is, is be prepared to grow a thick skin and no matter no matter what you do, if this is what you you really feel, become a lifer. You have to keep going and take the knocks and each know that each time you're actually getting better because of it. And um, it, it's just part of the ebbs and flows of uh, any sort of entertainment career, but. Um, it, it can get more exciting and it does get more exciting. And, and, you know, like Tom said before, I played to some kind of crazy crowds and all those things and you know, 25, 30,000 people and done all these things. But the small gigs are always the hardest, even if it's like 100 people, they're the, they're the ones you've really got to, got to be on your toes. But, but anyth anything, I'd say just like dedicate yourself to it and be prepared to take the knocks. Yeah. Oh no, that's a that's a brilliant answer. I think I've actually seen you sub play in Ibiza, but that's another story I'll catch on <laughs> later. I want um, to let, uh, Holly, hold, hold it for a second because I want I'm I'm gonna let let's just uh, let, I want everyone to see Yusuf play. So we're gonna try uh, if the technology will allow it. I'm gonna try and stream a bit from uh, YouTube of one of Yusuf's events in. This is called the uh, Yusuf Circus X Boiler Room Liverpool DJ set. Is that? Is that okay with you, Yusuf? Is that ringing? Yeah, any it was something like that. We, 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 we did a first, the first ever event in the Palm House in Liverpool. All right, so sit tight and let's see if we can make this uh, work. I have to do, uh, what do I have to do? I have to do that. 
I think, uh, let me just uh, fade that down. I haven't cut it straight off. I'm fading it down. So it's right, and then I have to fade it all back up again. Gosh, it's uh, challenging, especially if you're not used to doing these things. Wait a sec. Uh, I'll go to there. There we go. That should be okay. Well, we could we could certainly see you in action there. Um, then this, so you're doing more than, like I said, I mean, a DJ, you know, in my ancient mind, a DJ is just someone who sticks the record on and then goes and makes a cup of tea. Talk us through what we saw you're doing there and what the difference is. Well, no, the, the basics of DJing, even though this, the, the technology is kind of really advanced these days, it's playing great music in the right order. And going back to what Eduardo was saying, there's a real psychology in that because if you just come put some tunes on, and the people aren't feeling it, you have to be able to kind of almost feel the vibe in the room uh, physically to be able to kind of make the right decisions of what's next. But using all the technology these days, you can kind of create more, more technical moments, if you like, um, and which, which is what I'm kind of known for, for playing on four decks rather than two, and I get the excitement and this high energy and I'm doing all this stuff. But the reality is it always boils down to the same point. Make sure you're playing great music at the right time. Um, and that is something that you can't, you, it, it takes years to be able to kind of understand how that feels. Yeah. So it's very intuitive. Though. It's just something that builds up over time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. What um, you, you talked about um, also this kind of psychology of knowing uh, when to do an event and when the time is right for an uh, event and feeling what will and won't work. Just tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, not just as a DJ, obviously I run and own uh, circus events in Liverpool with my partner, Richard, and, and our small team. Um, but again, it's not just a case of, okay, we're going to book a DJ with me on a certain date and that's not enough. But there's a lot of kind of wider considerations, whether it's, it's kind of the right date. Even, even if you have the biggest DJ in the world, you have to make sure that it's the right date at the right time, the right venue, what's happening uh, locally with other events, mm. maybe even kind of socially or economically at the moment or, or other considerations, the weather, the time of year, and all yeah. these things have to, have to be taken into account before because it, it's, it, it's a risk. You know, it's not just, even though the whole point of everything we do is to kind of have fun, it's, it's, always, it's always like gambling in a lot of ways. Yeah. And Eduardo, yeah. you were telling us earlier about um, some of your work and how it relates to actual health and improving health. Do, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, I mean, it's not only related to health, but health is definitely a key component because some of the things that we discover nowadays is that the way that people use music in their lives actually give a lot of, uh, have an impact on their well-being. And now we are also learning that has a direct impact on, uh, on health in general. No, it's even, even being used to help people to cope with different things. So understanding the ways in which music is actually having that effect is part of the work that we do, essentially. You know, generating that evidence is also part of our work, also to promote the use of music in different contexts. But I think I would say that the, 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 one of the most important things for us is actually to empower people to be able to do it. You know, it's not just enough that we are able to say, you know, this thing might be working for you or not, but we are actually being able to provide people with the right tools um, uh, to do it, no. So we're doing projects, you know, a wide range of projects that you know go very much also with interactions that we have with different um, um, different people, different institutions. One of our focus is actually helping people to use music uh, to cope with depression and anxiety in everyday life, and providing them with the tools actually to do that in effective ways. Because not always the effects of music, the way we use it, are necessarily positive. 
Is there, um, and is there evidence that, that you can use music to make a difference to, you know, if people are feeling depressed, to help pull them out of that? There is on one hand, the things that I mentioned before about the way it interacts with the brain chemistry is one of the, the, the ideas that supports the, the possibility that music can improve your mood or help your mood be better. Um, my, my additional idea is also that um, if we use music, we can do it in ways that we cannot do with any other form of treatment because we can use music in any moment. It's something that is readily available in the, in the right time and we don't have to wait for a referral. We don't have to pay uh, whatever we might need to pay or drugs or whatever to deal with it. So it's available to us in different ways. Um, but there is evidence and there is even evidence from clinical trials that uh, could support that. But it has to be used in the right way. I think that's, I'm sure I've heard of that, of, of GPs prescribing things like music or dance or joining a choir as, as part of treatment to overcome things like depression. But it's important to make sure it's used yeah. in the right way. No, music, I mean, sorry, go on. Yeah, yes, sir. No, no I was just going to jump in and ask Eduardo a question, if that's okay. I mean, are, are there studies about um, music as a kind of um, social aspect? And obviously, because humans are naturally social, and of course, we thrive in a community. And of course, even with electronic music or rock music or hip hop or any of these things, it, it builds a community. So it, it, are there studies or are you studying to the, 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 the connection there? Um, yes, we don't focus specifically our research on that, but there is a lot of evidence. Actually, one of the, uh, the, the key uses of music for people in everyday life is related to social. Sometimes just to, and you mentioned that before, that we're also using music a way to define yourself before. That is one of the ways that, uh, uh, that we use music. Also, we use music to find people that are like us because our musical tastes also tell a lot more about ourselves. No, it's, it's just not we like what is like. It's about our personalities, the way that we see life, the way that we share ideals. But also music has this... Uh, very powerful uh, thing, which is brings people together. It allows people to synchronize at multiple levels. No, I mean, physically, we move together, syn synchronize with the music. Um, our minds synchronize in different ways. Our emotions also synchronize. And that's how it's so powerful to use it in events. We're talking about rapes here, but, you know, in the marriage, in any type of social event, in a party at home, music is there. Why? Because it allows people to merge and become kind of one, no? Absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I think when you uh, talk about music and dance, people synchronizing, um, my wife might have comments about that uh, when she's standing opposite me. But uh, <laughs> I think as a, as a general principle, yeah. And it, it's kind of also interesting to think of, you know, we think of that kind of Yusuf type dance that we've been seeing. But then I'm also thinking of things like line dancing, very coordinated dancing, but it, it still has that same effect, doesn't it, of bringing social cohesion? Absolutely, it, you know, music. It really is all about connection, commun and community. It's a, it's the centre, you know, with 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 food. Really, it's absolutely uh, essential to human existence in a lot of ways. Does that uh, go on, Eduardo? Yeah, how, how do you go? I mean, there are even uh, speculations, of course, because there are speculations. But it's quite interesting evidence to support it that the the whole origin of music and dance might be actually uh, be related to this capacity of bringing people together. No. Um, as if music and dance are just the modern versions of of sounds and, and movement patterns that allow people to communicate with each other and to bond. So there are some perspectives or some theories that see the evolution of music and dance like that, which is interesting from one side to uh, allow parents and children to communicate and establish strong bond, uh, bonds. And we are talking about before language, we couldn't talk, right? But also because this capacity that music has to synchronize people is very powerful because we can synchronize action. We can, uh, I mean, if we go back to a long time ago, we can hunt together, we can perform physical activities together, we can collaborate together also to yeah. synchronize our minds. How powerful, how important is that for big societies like ours? Eventually, music is a bit of the glue that uh, made this possible. Absolutely. And, and, and even like to procreate as well, which is part of the, you know, you can imagine, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this is just my imagination working, you know, thinking of going on what you're saying, but, but absolutely you can imagine cave people just dancing around to banging drums and, you know, you can feel uh, more of a, a connection to another person because, because of it. It's really, really a kind of um, 
it's very interesting to just think about that. The no, they also there are also theories that propose that actually they had a role in uh, uh, in creating some type of support sexual life as well, and in bringing people together also at those levels. No? So they are ideas. I mean, Darwin was one of the, uh, one of the proponents. I see. Well, see, it's certainly, uh, I mean, I, I, so I, when I talk to the medical students, I always talk about, I compare humans to viruses and I talk about how simple viruses are, just a, a few genes and all they want to do is reproduce and they manage to do it with a few genes and, uh, you know, hijacking bodies like ours, you know, if you think about the coronavirus. And I contrast that with humans who we have tens of thousands of genes. And essentially, you know, we're also just trying to procreate, but we create all these strange rituals like, you know, certainly dance. It's a it's an important part of the whole courting process, isn't it? I mean, you you probably wouldn't use the word courting, but it, you know, that's how people meet, it's how people get together. And um, you know, it's kind of a critical part of the whole thing. Um, but I wondered when you when you talk about so I think the origins are really interesting and we we you know one always tries to think well okay how does this compare with other animals and you think about songbirds with you know their songs which are clearly musical but are there any um, for example are there any apes that have any kind of music or dancing rituals do, do either of you know that uh, no but they are they are uh potential explanations that of what music and dance might be that come from there, you know? Uh, they are, uh, these ideas that I was saying before, they also attempt to explain it from earlier moments in evolution that might say it was basically a need to communicate with more people at the same time. And for example, apes do it by grooming, which is a manual thing by the touching, right? If, if you use your voice, you can actually reach more people at the same time, right? So you can do some sort of vocal grooming and that, that means that you can actually enlarge your social groups. So that's another perspective on seeing eventually that, you know, these, these vocal patterns can evolve into something that we call now, now music. But the interesting thing is that it's, of course, very odd to look at this nowadays and think, come on, music cannot be like that. But if you actually look at the ways that people use music nowadays, it's still a lot like that because we still use music to be, come together. We still use music to regulate ourselves. We all sing to our babies. I mean, that's an universal thing. Every culture in the world dances to music. There must be something very fundamental and very powerful. A baby is born uh, in a way that he already responds rhythmically to music. No, they move to music. There's something fundamental about it that eventually um, we'll hopefully understand more. I've, yeah, yeah I've, I've been struck by that as well. Young, I remember seeing a very young kid that could barely stand up um, at, at a music festival. And the minute the beat starts, they start rocking. There is something innate, isn't there, in us to respond to, to the beat? Absolutely. I, 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 similarly, I, I remember going to um, Havana, like probably 28, 28 years ago now. And, uh, and when we, we got taken around by, by one of the guys you met in the street to, to his home. And it was like a rundown apartment block, and they had absolutely nothing. And you know, they just wanted to show us around to get a few dollars. And Havana was a very different place then. And we went up these kind of super dark stairs into his house, and um, all they had was a television. And they put the music on, and there was this baby standing there, just just dancing around as soon as as soon as the music come on. So even in a position when people have absolutely nothing, there's still music. Funny to, yeah, and it's hard to imagine a world without music, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going we're to come back to Holly uh, in, in a second, but um, Yusuf, I, I gather you met, uh, I mean, obviously you're, you're among very distinguished company today, and I know this will be one of your <laughs> career highlights, um, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I think you met Prince William somewhere along the way as well. D tell us about that. Yeah, actually, I mean, I, I guess it, it led on, rather a lot from, from, from your work in, in the city, to be, to be honest. Now, what happened after, was it before or after the mass test? It must have been after, of course, um, when Liverpool got put, put into to Tier 4 ahead of anywhere else in the country. Now, there was, rightly so, a lot of pushback on that. And um, Prince William, or, or the Lord Lieutenant of Liverpool, um, found out that Prince William and had a kind of um, aversion to this and wanted to find out what was happening with, with the, the businesses in the city. So 
because I cover a lot of bases, entertainment, events, uh, hospitality in some ways, record label, I've, for some reason, um, I was recommended by Liverpool Council, by the Lord Lieutenant, to speak to Prince William. So we set up this, this uh, Zoom call. Um, subsequently, they invited Natalie from uh, Leaf in Ball Street as well. So it was just the three of us to have this conversation. And I, I was a little bit taken aback by it. Why? would he have any sort of interest? But because, like, as the, the conversation unfolded, which I thought was only going to be a few minutes, and it ended up being, um, like, a 45, 50-minute Zoom call. And it was what was really interesting as well. At the very beginning, obviously, I've never spoken to any royals before. Um, we asked what the protocol was, as in, you know, do you have to call them this, or just sit up straight, whatever it is. And all they said was, like, look, just give it to him, as in, don't, you know sugarcoat anything just tell them exactly what's going on with your businesses and that's all you want to hear and th there was no script there was no kind of um him you know looking to the left and kind of go yeah 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 he was literally very very engaged he wanted to kind of find out what was going on and our concerns myself and natalie's about the fact that our businesses have been being completely decimated not just ours you know of course a large portion of, of the city because of this new tier four rule he wanted to get some information, take it back and take it straight to the government the next, very next day, which is precisely what he did. Um, so even though it was really interesting and a kind of a real honour, I guess, curious honour would be probably the best way to put it because I'm like, mm. no royalist. But, you know, he, the fact that he had such a profile, it was nice for him to take the time. Um, but he did take some of our concerns straight to number 10 or, or wherever. And hopefully they were used and implemented to kind of help the city get beyond covid in some small way yeah interesting and he was a decent bloke was he he was just a normal fella and what what else was interesting as well I, I, he was what, what, what's his team oh what's his team? something weird like west ham or something in the midlands isn't it um aston villa or something like aston villa <clears throat> yeah now because I'm, you know i was kind of trying to be very almost like business-like and easy going and not cracking any stupid jokes and all that stuff but um he, he said, if, if there's anything else that you need, and, and I was like, well, Aston Villa beat Liverpool 7-2 <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> and he goes, I wanted to say it the whole conversation. Because <laughs> he was trying to keep a deadpan face as well, because he thought that we were you know, having a really tough time. But you could see when we were talking, like I say, there's no script. And he was just a regular guy in, in his own way. And he was yeah. genuinely apparently con like really concerned and it felt like a normal conversation and like i say it wasn't five minutes or ten minutes as expected it was, it was 45 no script and he was nice he was a seemed like a nice guy can i ask you something is it on this topic yeah. actually well not on the royalty but the topic of conversation do you think that um i mean we've been talking about how powerful it was the event that you've been organizing at Hitra, but uh, people suffered also a lot for not having access to music and live music and the arts in general during the, the pandemic period. Do you think that now you come out stronger from that? You in general, the music scene, the artists in general, do you think there will be a perspective that we have to support more the arts as a result of what we learned um, during the pandemic? Well, I'd say a few things have, have happened. Um, the creativity out there for everyone in terms of like the music scene seems to have improved uh, because people have, have had a chance to take the time to kind of sit back and not kind of rush. Uh, what else has happened as well is the, the gender and sexuality balance has really improved in terms of it's not just kind of uh, white men DJing anymore. The, the pandemic kind of reintroduced a kind of range of sexualities and genders and colors and creeds much more prominently into, into the music scene, which, which is welcomed, of course. And on top of that, there seems to be a real kind of music appreciation and kind of event appreciation. You know, people are so happy to be out. Um, however, on the other side of things, um, there's been quite a hard attrition rate. And that means the amount of people who have bought tickets that don't show up to the events has been really kind of, it's, it's almost balancing, balancing off a little bit now, but there was a point where it had gone from maybe sometimes 30, 40% of the people that had bought tickets uh, are just not showing up. 
And you might think, oh, that's okay. They bought tickets, we'll keep the money. But it doesn't work like that because the, the economy of, of, of an event is, especially with us, the people who have bought the ticket need to spend a certain amount on the bar to, to make it economically stack up. Because obviously we've got the bar staff, the security, we bought the drinks, the lights, and all the all these things, all the real world economics. So that made things pretty difficult. But I have to say, um, overall, even though it's still difficult, and we're definitely not in a position that we were pre-COVID in terms of the um, the, the, the ability to kind of run your business. To to, to be to be blunt, the, the there seems to be more appetite for the music now than there was before more availability, more people engaged, and hopefully it's going to have a positive future. But that wasn't Thanks. too long. So it's Tom. <laughs> no, it's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm listening. I'm too busy listening. I'm forgetting that I'm supposed to be hosting something. Apologies. It's, um, no, it's a fascinating discussion. And of course, we'll get, we will get Holly in a sec. But the other thing that has come out of this um, uh you know, your first dance event, which, uh, you know, had millions of people around the world were aware of it. I know through the news and everything was, um, of course, we met recently at the launch of the Pandemic Institute, which is Liverpool's new initiative to help uh, prevent the impact of future pandemics. And I think, um, Yusuf, indirectly, you were involved in sort of galvanising the interest in that from the guy, Daniel Elliott from Innova. Is that just to tell us that story? Cause I like that. It's a great story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course. Um, after everything that we've we done, myself and Richard um, and our team, and I keep, I always like to make, to make sure that they all mention that everything we do because it definitely wasn't just me. Um, we, I was invited to the opening of the pandemic Institute at the um what's the building sorry tom uh, spine the spine the building, spine building just behind here um, yeah yeah and it, it was super nice to be involved and to be asked to actually speak and explain a little bit about my perspective because there was a, a range of um academics really on on the, the panel to, to be able to speak and, and then me so i guess i had a more of a different approach or refreshing tone and and, and that was cool to be able to say a few words but um, Mr. Elliot, at, at the end of it, who who was there to build to, to to open the pandemic institute, he took me to one side, and this was really really unexpected. And I have to say, with all the kind of plaudits and everything that's come from the first dance, this was the one that kind of blew me away a lot. He said that he was sitting in his home in America somewhere, in his probably in his, his villa or wherever it was, and he seen what was happening in, in Liverpool, and he was so blown away by the energy and the excitement and when I played free by Ultra and the, the Tay and he just felt really motivated by it but from that moment he goes okay I've got to do something about it so he got in touch with uh, the powers that be and helped set up the Liverpool Pandemic Institute and contributed 10 million pounds on the spot came over we opened the Pandemic Institute in, in Liverpool and during this conversation he said he's going to donate yet another £10 million. And the whole point of the Pandemic Institute is to prepare the UK and beyond to be able to kind of get ready for the next pandemic rather than kind of like so we could hit the ground running going forward. So to be, like again, I'm very cautious when I say this, but to have some tiny contribution to be able to help people get beyond COVID or beyond whatever's next um, mm. was... The, the, the honor of honors in a lot of ways so to help it's always fantastic for me sure yeah fabulous all right well holly do please join us and tell us what's been happening out there hi yeah so there's a few different questions i know we're short on time so i'll just try and be quick so don't worry don't worry we're okay we're okay. um so there's one from carla on zoom which says um what effect do you think social media has on people truly being able to lose themselves in the music and um, a lot of what i see is people trying to look picture perfect for social media so that's probably most relevant to yusuf i would think no, well, I, I, I understand that. And, and I guess that's um, a generational thing. Back in my day, it wasn't like that. And you know what? <laughs> it, it wasn't. But there's one thing that I, I need to make clear here is these 18 to 30 year olds or whatever <clears throat> are coming in and having their kind of first experience. Um, it, it's just, it feels exactly the same to them as it did for us when we first went out. Now, the fact that they've got phones and they can cap capture that experience and, and then relive it, that's just a, a symptom of being living in 2022 rather than 1992. So 
you know, if they want to do that, then great. There's no, who are we to say that they are not having the same kind of magical experience with the music that we had then? All you're going to do is ask them individually, and I'm pretty sure they are. I understand what what they're saying about being picture perfect, Mm. but I don't don't think that's connected to the experience with the music. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, Just a couple for um, Eduardo. Someone, um, Jenny on Zoom, asked, how can music be used to bring back memories, and can that be used in people with um, dementia or Alzheimer's to try and, you know, take them back and bring back some memories? Yes, this has been actually one a very popular uh, topic in the last 10 years. So the fact is that we have so many experiences with music, especially, or and many positive experiences, especially when we are young, I mean, with your parents or in the parties with Yusef, um, that those things get very much ingrained in our minds, no? those memories of those moments, the emotions that come with them. And uh, these remote memories or these memories from the early years, childhood and even early adulthood, uh, they remain with you for longer, even if you have dementia. No? So the power of music is unique in that, whereas you might not be able to recollect those emotions by yourself intentionally, if you hear the tune, the music does the rest. The music makes the link to the moment, to the history, to all the emotions that you felt in those moments are reenacted in yourself just by listening to the music. And that's extremely powerful. It's just the way that also dementia affects the brain and also music finds it finds its way in and uh, helps people um, with dementia in that way as well. And it improves their well-being in general, no? which is uh, very powerful as well. Yeah, that's so it's so interesting, all of this. Um, there's another quick one for Eduardo from James on Facebook, who's asking, um, do you think the psychology of music should be taught in schools rather than just, you know, I guess, basic music and learning instruments and music theory? Should the psychology be taught at an earlier age? Um, I would say that, you know, music psychology is so broad, it crosses so transdisciplinary, it crosses so many things because music is very complex that I think there are bits of it that are already taught because it's almost, it's, even when you teach music theory or, or, or you teach an, an instrument, you're also already including elements of the types of things that music psychology teaches. I would say though, and I find that even at university level is not such a widespread thing, that understanding music at this level would be important. So teaching younger kids about that, I definitely teach my kid about the power of music to do many different things, you know? to pay attention to the way he feels, to connect with his emotions, to, to, see, you know, to feel good about his body when he moves and dances. So all these things, I think it would be very important. So not just to focus on performance or creating music, but also all the opportunities that it affords and all the experiences that we have that make our life better. So I think it should be part of it, definitely. Great. And um, just one final question for Yusuf, or well, for, no, for anyone actually. Um, do you people do you think that people have easier access to music nowadays? And is this a, is this a good thing? Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll take that one. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it, it feels like the emotional journey of going to buy a vinyl record back in the day because you would save up and then you'd think about it all week and then you'd go to the record shop and it's in, it's done, got it, yeah, then you take it home and you would treasure that. In fact, I've started doing it again. I'm teaching, I'm teaching my children about the lineage between, um, you know, black music all the way and why, and why all these different albums are connected and it's all on vinyl, I'm trying to teach them, teach them that. But that's a different thing because I, I love that journey. But, you know, obviously with, with, places like Spotify now, which are just kind of the, you know, biggest musical um, place to kind of access music of all time. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week to people anywhere in the world at any moment. So even though, um, of, of, of course, it's well documented about the economics of it are kind of challenging, but if the shop is open 24 hours a day, the record store, then it's a different thing. But now, there's much more access to to music and there's much more ability for people to kind of be heard and seen by different people anywhere in the world at any at any moment so i don't see that as a bad thing it's it's almost like a level playing field in some ways mm. 
democratized it hasn't it as as have have so many things have been democratized but what's not going to be democratized is this podcast because i'm in charge (laughs) and uh we've gone we've gone over slightly um but i you know it's been a fascinating discussion um so thank you both very much i should just let people know i forgot to say at the start that please um find the podcast in your usual place on google or apple or wherever and whilst you're there please uh rate review and like the podcast and then um, our numbers will go up next time uh, our next pod- scout science podcast is on the 26th of april when we have the former health secretary matt hancock mp joining us which is a bit of a coup and also matt ashton matthew ashton who's a local public health uh, doctor running uh, who's been running the public health response in liverpool so well, i think m- that- m- m- matt was our guy in the first dance as well Exactly. Yeah, he's a yeah, he's yeah. a great bloke, a great link yeah, and connector. Brilliant, brilliant. He's made so much happen in Liverpool. So it'll be interesting to get his perspectives on things as well as those of the former health secretary, uh, Matt Hancock. So please all join us then. But for now, after three, we will all wave and we will say goodbye. One, two, three. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.